Hello and welcome back. In today's video, let's dig into the scopes panel in Affinity Photo. I had a couple of viewers requesting a video about it and here it is. I will try to explain the various modes in the scopes panel and towards the end of the video, I will also share a couple of ways how they can be used to improve your photos. To kick off, we need to enable the scopes panel. In my setup, it's already enabled. If it's not enabled in your setup, you can quickly enable it using the studio menu and selecting scopes from the view option. The scopes panel has a couple of modes and I will go through them one by one. So the first one is the intensity waveform. In short, the intensity waveform shows how the luminosity is distributed in your image. To show you better how it works, I will use this gradient as an example and set the sampler to HSL, so we can see the luminance values. When I move my mouse from the left to the right, you see how the luminosity decreases first, followed by an increase and finally decreases again. This is also exactly what the intensity waveform shows. The intensity waveform shows per X position all the luminosity values in the same X position. In this gradient example, there is only one color value per X position. And this is why we get this nice line. If I would duplicate this gradient and rotate it 90 degrees, we will get this block. As now, per X position, there are multiple luminance values. Let me undo that and share one important detail with you. If you watched closely while I was moving my mouse, you might have noticed that the luminance values from the sampler do not match the values in the waveform. Why is that? Well, that is because the luminance values are based from black and white. Let me add a channel mixer adjustment and convert the gradient to black and white. If I now double check the values, they do match. So the begin is 62% according to the sampler and this matches with the value on the waveform. I can do a couple of other checks, but they now all do match. So this is something to keep in mind, but in general, it gives you an idea where the bright and dark spots are in your image. Let's use the intensity waveform on an image and see what we can get out of it. So here I have a cityscape and looking at the intensity waveform, you see that the left part of the image is darker as the top values in the waveform are lower compared with the right side of the waveform. If we look closely to the image, we can confirm that the right part of the image is indeed more bright, especially in the sky area, as there is more sun in the part of that image. Let's also have a quick look at this cute kitten. In looking at the intensity waveform, we can quickly see that this is a dark image. And there are some peaks in the luminosity. These are the grey and white areas we see in the image. As the waveform represents the whole image, let me make a screenshot of it and paste the screenshot of the intensity waveform to the document. I can now transpose it over the white of the image. The intensity waveform shows the positions of the peak luminosity values in the image. Notice how the light grey areas show up in the waveform, especially these three peaks, which correspond with the light coming through. In a way, the intensity waveform confirms what you're seeing in the image regarding the darker and the lighter areas. Pretty awesome. Let's have a look at this grumpy cat. If we look at the intensity waveform, we see two horizontal lines. The top horizontal line is the background color, which is quite bright, and the lower horizontal line is the color of the floor. There are also two peaks, and these are probably the lighter hair colors around the face below the ears. Later on the video, I will explain 
how the intensity waveform can assist you on making decisions when applying adjustments. Let's move to the next scope, the RGB waveform. The idea of the RGB waveform is exactly the same as the intensity waveform. However, instead of using luminosity values, it will show the R, G and the B values per exposition. I will again, for clarity, make a screenshot of the scope and transpose it to the image. Let me also change the sampler to RGB so we can see the RGB values for the pixel under my cursor. Notice when I move my mouse from the left to the right, it corresponds with the values in the chart. Interesting side detail here is that when two or more channel values are on top of each other, it will show the combined color. For example, here, the blue and the green follow the same value changes and the line is shown in cyan, which is the sum of green and blue. Let me enable a different gradient. And now you see the yellow line, which means that the red and the green are at the same positions. If you see white in the RGB waveform, it means that all the channels have a value at that position. Before showing some examples, I will also focus on the next scope, the RGB Parade, as this is exactly the same as the RGB waveform, but the channels are separated in three columns. Let me bring back the RGB waveform screenshot for this gradient. Now I'll take a new screenshot of the RGB Parade and paste it also to the document. As mentioned, the waves per channel are shown in three columns. The red wave is shown on the left, the green in the middle and the blue on the right. If you look closely, the waves have the same shape. Only difference is that they are made narrower to fit into one third of the available area. Let me quickly widen it so we can see that the waves are exactly the same. I will widen the RGB Parade screenshot by using the transform panel and multiplying the existing white exactly with 3. I can now use the align center function so that the green channel is shown. Well, my screenshot was not perfect, so I need to move it a little bit, but you get the idea. The green wave from the RGB Parade is the same as the green wave from the RGB waveform. We can double check the red by aligning the screenshot to the left and the blue by aligning the screenshot to the right. As expected, the waves are the same. Excellent. Now let's have a look at our example images. Here is the RGB waveform and it is actually a color version of the intensity wave. Looking at it, you can conclude that the blues are the highlights, especially on the left part of the image, and that the reds are more in the darker tones. When we switch to RGB Parade, we can see this more clearly. The blue values are higher and more concentrated to the top, whereas the red values are more evenly spread. You could also say that the red wave is an intensity waveform of the red channel. If I turn on our cute kitten image, the RGB parade will contain the same values for each channel, as this is a black and white image. If we move to our grumpy cat, we notice that the blue channel is a bit out of sync. We can also notice this when we change the mode of the scope to RGB waveform. On to the next mode, the power spectral density. This is the scope that is the most difficult to explain, but let me give it a try. Before doing that, let's go back to our gradient example. We now have a flat line. The power spectral density is all about frequency. When we talk about frequency in photo retouching, we are talking about the color value shifts in an area. So when you have a gradient, the values of the colors change very slowly. 
because that is how a gradient works. It gradually changes color. This is also called low frequency. When the color values change quickly, it becomes a high frequency image. This is also the logic behind the well-known high frequency separation technique. In the power spectral density scope, we can get a feeling of the frequencies in the image. The high frequencies are represented as speckles or dots and the low frequencies as lines. As I have a gradient here, we don't see any speckles or dots. But let's add a noise filter to the gradient. See how the scope changed immediately? We have added a lot of pixels that rapidly change color, comparing to the neighboring pixels. Or in other words, we added high frequency values. The spectral density scope can help you to decode this information. If I remove the noise, the speckles are gone. If you watch closely, you notice that we only have a horizontal line. And that is because the pixels values do not change along the vertical axis. Let me rotate the gradient and see what happens. Interesting, we now also have a vertical line as pixel values also change in the vertical axis. We also introduced a bit more high frequency, which is probably due to the fact that the vertical gradient does not transition nicely with the horizontal gradient. Personally, I don't use this scope that much, but let's see what it shows with our city image. And this is how the spectral density scope will look for most images, as most photos will contain a lot of low and high frequencies. Blurred photos, on the other hand, will be low frequency, and I can show that by adding a Gaussian blur filter to this image. By adding the blur, we remove the high frequency, as we can see in the scope. Remember I mentioned about the vertical and the horizontal axis? Well, let's add a motion blur in different angles, and you can see how this reacts in the scope. By adding a motion blur, you smoothen the pixel values in a specific direction, or in other words, lower the frequency in a direction. And this then shows up in our scope. Well, that was interesting, I hope. Time for our final scope, the vector scope. This scope is used frequently in video editing world, but I believe it can also be very useful in photo retouching. Let's get back to our test gradient and see what this scope is showing us. Basically it shows us every used hue and saturation in a wheel. The center of the wheel has no saturation and the saturation increases as you move away from the center. If we look at our gradient, we can see the colors we are moving between. We start with the green, move to the red and then to the magenta and so on. With the help of an HSL adjustment, I can demonstrate how the vector scope works. If I lower the saturation, everything moves to the center. Increasing the saturation has no effect in the vector scope. The gradient start colors were already fully saturated colors, and increasing the saturation in the HSL adjustment only affected the colors in between them but they were already shown in the vector scope. Remember, the vector scope does not show the amount of pixels, but the amount of colors. I can also rotate the hue, which as you can see will affect the shape. The shape will be rotated too. I think you get the idea. The vector scope, in a way, tells you how your colors are distributed. Let's have a look how this looks with our city example image. Looking at the vector scope, you can see the image is more towards the blue and the cyan, which makes sense as we have a lot of sky. The scope also shows that there is a lot of variation in the yellow-red color range. Again, this totally makes sense because of the lines and the sun in the city. 
If we go to our cute kitten, nothing shows up. Of course, this makes sense because there is no color. The grumpy cat, on the other hand, is not so much saturated and the most colors are between the yellow and the blue. As we got all the scopes covered now, let's have a look at some practical use cases starting with the vector scope. One very common use of the vector scope is for matching skin colors. Let me paste a photo with a face. If we look closely at the vector scope, there is a diagonal line between the red and the yellow, around 11 o'clock. This line is designed to represent blood flow going through human skin. You want to pay attention to this line to ensure people's skin actually look human on camera. And this goes regardless of any individual's ethnicity. With the help of a curves adjustment, we can adjust the color channels to make sure the color is more on this area. In this case, we can increase the reds and lower the blues to get the colors more on the skin line. You can also use other adjustments like a color balance, in which you can increase the red and the yellows in the midtones and the highlights. Also make sure that the adjustment only applies to the skin area. I will mask it very quickly and dirty to give you an idea. To make it blend better, we can use the blend ranges for a more natural look. Let's have a quick look at the before. Not bad at all. Now, let's have a look at a practical example for the RGB parade using our grumpy cat. If we look at the RGB parade, you can see the image is not balanced perfectly. The blue is a bit out of sync with the rest of the other color channels. So I can add a curves layer and adjust the blue and the green channel to make them more in sync with the red. And in the next example, I will be using the intensity waveform. This time, I will use the city photo as an example. As I previously mentioned, the left part of this image is darker, which we can clearly see in the waveform. There's nothing wrong with that, but suppose we want to fix that. I can add a curves adjustment and brighten things up. As we only want to brighten the left part, I will invert the built-in mask of the curves adjustment and then paint back on the areas that need to be brightened up. We probably will not be able to fix this with one adjustment. I'm going to add another curves adjustment, but this time I'm going to darken things a bit and apply it to the right part, so that part gets more balance with the left part of the image. So let's have a quick look at the before and the after. Awesome! As we want these adjustments to apply only on the brighter areas of the image, I can adjust the blend range of these adjustments so it blends a bit more smoothly. Let's go back to our grumpy cat and use the intensity waveform this time to make it more interesting and fix some issues. First thing I want to do is to darken the lower bottom line in the waveform which represents the floor area. So I do get a bit more contrast with the background and the subject. Again, very simple, just a curves adjustment to lower the luminosity and mask this adjustment so that it only applies to the floor. As I mask it, you notice how the bottom line now moves lower. I think I can make the cat itself a bit darker. So let me add another curves adjustment. Well, this is interesting. Somehow Affinity got confused and is showing a part of the layer below. Let me hide this bottom gradient layer to get rid of that. Usually, when you get these kind of issues, something has been messed up in memory. Closing and reloading the image helps most of the time. Anyway, I can now invert the adjustment with Command I and paint it back in with a white brush to bring more contrast to the fur. As you might notice, there is a little bump in the intensity waveform in the top line. This is the area in the image with this white spot in the background. 
Let me fix that by adding a pixel layer and painting it over with a color from the background. I hope these examples have given you an idea how the scopes can be used. In the meantime, I will finish up our grumpy cat by giving more color to the eyes and adding a bit more contrast to the darker areas in the fur. It was a long video, but I think it was definitely worth it. The scopes panel can be very useful for detecting and correcting issues on your photos as we have seen. Are they required? I don't think so. Most of the time it just confirms what you already know. But I do like the scopes very much and from time to time they are quite useful to really fine tune some details. One big disadvantage for the time being, for me at least, is that they cannot be sized or zoomed in. Sometimes it's difficult to read the information, especially when all the data is very close to each other and having an option to zoom in or make it larger would definitely help. Well, I hope you liked this video. If you did, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons. Thanks for watching, keep safe and creative. Until the next video.